Muy buenos días, muy buenas tardes, muy buenas noches. Este es un unboxing que se me ha requerido desde hace tiempo y quiero agradecer a, a Jesús Escudero, el director de Querigma, por mandarme el libro y así poderlo tener en español y también en inglés. Me refiero al libro en inglés a este libro, Why the Gospel, L Living the Good News of King Jesus with, with Purpose, por Matthew Bates. Y este libro ganó el mejor libro de teología popular del 2024 por Christianity Today. Y aquí está en español. ¿Por qué el Evangelio? Viviendo con propósito las buenas nuevas de Jesús, el Rey. Quisiera brevemente decirle de, de no tanto de qué se trata el libro, pero cómo es que está este libro. Y quisiera enseñarle a, adentro. Bueno, primero que miren la, la diferencia entre el de, el de inglés y español. El de, el de español es más grande. Es, es, también es más ancho, ¿ves? es un poquito más ancho, vamos a ver, un poquito, sí, un poquito más ancho, pero es más, pero más alto, eso sí, o sea que la, la letra la tiene más grande, más grande, así que eso es bueno. Otra, otra cosa que, eh, que tiene este, que este tiene las notas al final del libro, a mí me gusta que este las tiene eh, las notas al pie del libro, a mí, a mí me gustan mucho más las notas al pie, le quiero enseñar una, una nota al pie, eh, una nota de pie grande, porque a veces que, que, que las hace grandes, a veces pequeñas, bueno, esta está suficiente, una nota al pie, ahí, ahí lo pueden ver. Mientras que este eh, pone todas las notas al final del libro, y a mí no me gusta eso. Aquí están las notas del capítulo 1, ahí está el final del libro, o sea que usted tiene que estar siempre yendo para, para atrás a ver qué, qué dice. Bueno, entonces, eh, este libro, el... La, es, es igualito, la única diferencia es, como es usual eh, con los libros de habla hispana, es que eh, tiene, eh, al final tiene recursos recomendados, igual como en, eh, igual como en, en inglés, hay, hay eh, cosas introductorias, Michael Bird, eh, anti Wright, Intermedios y Avanzados. Así que para estar al día con respecto a este tema de la salvación y el evangelio, eh, son dos páginas que no se la puedo enseñar, yo voy a dejar que mejor uh, la, agarren el libro. Eh, así que este, este, pero on, on, donde siempre eh, es diferente, y yo pido, yo pido a todos, pero bueno, es que no tiene el índice de, de escritura y no tiene el índice de temas. Eh, de escritura es algo largo, sí, eh, pero porque tiene hasta Clemente, los, los Ciprianos, los, los Roy de los Muertos, Josefu, eh, cuatro, cuatro cosas, los Roy de los Muertos. Eh, eh, José fue antigüedades y las guerras y orígenes, así que y tiene, y tiene todo, lo, to, todo el índice del, del, de lo que cita tanto en el antiguo como en el nuevo, y también tiene eh, eh, tiene un, in, un eh, índice de sujetos o de, o, de, o de temas y ahí está el índice de, de escritura y otros escritos antiguos desgraciadamente el de español no lo, no lo tiene ¿qué es lo que pasa con eso? es que usted tiene que leer todo el libro para encontrar eso eso me, eh, estaba hablando con mi esposa, me dijo, no, es que tienen que leerme, dice. Y lo mismo eh, creo que piensa eh, Jesús Escudero. De ahí el libro es igual, y vamos a ver lo que hay dentro del libro. Eh, el, el, yo creo que en español, como, como acabo de decir, es mejor, eh, tiene hasta, la, hasta los mismos, eh, la, las mismas recomendaciones, casi todas. Michael Bird, aquí está, mira, aquí dice... Dice de Michael Baird, decano y profesor del Nuevo Testamento en Ridley, que es donde yo estudio, cuando estudio un, algo en inglés, ahí es donde lo estudio, así que eh, este, este está, eh, está recomendado por ello. Eh, veamos lo que, lo, lo que hay adentro. Va, va, vamos a ver aquí, eh, les voy a enseñar brevemente <coughs> lo, que, lo que hay en, la, en, en los capítulos. Vamos a ver aquí, vamos a ver cómo se ve también en la página... Como, como lo están viendo ustedes, ah, lo, lo, quizás lo quieren ver más grande, ahí está mejor. Ok, vamos a ver solamente lo de el contenido, el prólogo Scott McKnight, eh, que prontamente ustedes lo van a estar conociendo más también, introducción, primero el rey, ahí está, eh, ¿por qué Cristo determina el propósito, el propósito del evangelio? Llamar a Jesús el Cristo entonces, llamar a Jesús el Cristo ahora. Ah, recordemos que esto es algo práctico, es teología popular, pero está siguiendo el tema de, de la alianza, de salvación por alianza sola. Eh, así que mucho, mucho no le gusta ese tema, pero yo creo que vale la pena eh, verlo. Eh, quiero ver, que, que, eh, ok, vamos a ver aquí para dónde es que tengo que ir. Ok, ya. Vamos a ver, vamos a ver. Porque 
aquí, 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 aquí tengo unas cosas, cosas que, que no me acuerdo por dónde tengo que ir. Sí, por acá. Ok. Entonces, eh, preguntas para discusión o reflexión. Siempre tiene eso. Fa, eh, famoso en, en algún lugar. Seis evangelios y propósitos distorsionados. Este, 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 este capítulo es buenísimo porque hay evangelios distorsionados. Y no, y no quiero hablarlo tanto porque... Eh, como ustedes pudieron ver, hay una entrevista, así que él, él va a hablar de todo eso, así que voy a dejar, pero el evangelio, los evangelios destruccionados, eh, las dos caras de la gloria, la gloria intrínseca, la gloria reconocida, introducción al cielo de gloria, cuatro, la recuperación del evangelio, yo, y yo sé que eso lo han hablado muchos eh, pseudo reformados en Latinoamérica, o bautistas reformados, por decir así, que son part bautistas particulares, Muchos han, han, han hecho eso, que quieren recobrar el evangelio, pero quieren recobrar el evangelio del siglo XVI y no quieren recobrar el evangelio de Jesús. Así que este capítulo sería muy bueno. Sustitución, ahí está, la encarnación. Y, y él al final de, de, de la entrevista va a hablar de eh, los próximos eh, eh, proyectos que tiene y tiene que hablar acerca de esto, la sustitución. De, van a oír, van a ver lo que dice él. Renado Victorioso. El Cristo Víctor, o sea que aquí está dando la, las diferentes teorías de expiación, de sí, las, las, las diferentes teorías de expiación. Eh, así que pueden apreciar un poco reconciliación, reinado victorioso, sustitución, la sustitución penal, da, da, da cuatro, da cuatro, sustitución, reinado victorioso, eh, Cristo Víctor, influencia moral, reconciliación, algo que yo he hecho también en este canal. Eh, hace años atrás, usted puede ver eh, teoría de expiación y usted va a, a, a encontrarlo. Eh, transformación real, y ahí va hablando de la transformación real, los cinco pasos de la visión transformadora, el, aparece la imagen impecable, contemplar la imagen ideal, cap, capacitados para ver, transformados juntos a su imagen, conforme a su imagen. Y de ahí viene buenas nuevas para los nones. ¿Y cuáles son los nones? Los nones, los que no tienen ninguna denominación, los que no se consideran que son eh, de bautistas o, o, o primitarianos o luteranos, ellos no, ellos no son de nada. Entonces, a ellos también hay que darle las buenas nuevas porque aún en, en ese, en ese, dentro de ese ámbito se ha perdido el evangelio. Dice, evangelizando al revés con propósito, invertir nuestra invitación Invertir nuestra invitación al evangelio, invertir el contenido, reorientar el punto de decisión, volver a dar prioridad al individuo y al grupo, recalibrar el, oje, el objetivo principal del evangelio, invertir una presentación completa del evangelio. Y eso es tremendo, porque eso cuesta. Ok, y, y esta es la última página. Es un disclaimer. Ahí, ahí termina entonces. Recursos con recomendados, sí. Eh, evangeliz, evangelizando al revés con propósito. Y recursos recomendados, los que, lo que dije acerca de lo... De, de libros introductorios, intermedios y avanzados con respecto a este tema. Bueno, entonces ese es el, ese es el libro de Matthew Bates, eh, en inglés, Why the Gospel, Living the Good News of King Jesus with Purpose, y o oh, por qué el Evangelio viviendo con propósito, las buenas nuevas de Jesús el Rey, que como aquí pueden ver, Aquí dice de que ganó el premio de, de teolo, Mejor Teología Popular del 2024 de Christianity Today. Y vamos a hablar ahí en la entrevista qué pasó cuando él ganó. Recomendado este libro. Eh, si ustedes com, eh, compraron el libro anterior de él, también publicado por Kerigma, eh, es Salvación por, por, por Alianza. Eh, entonces, este, este sería un buen libro para complementar eso, aunque no, se, aunque no está hablando específicamente de eso pero complementa de una forma más pastoral lo que, eh, lo que está hablando, el tema que él está tocando. Viene otro, o, o, otra entrevista con Matthew Bates, también ha, ha sacado otro libro, así que eh, yo, yo, yo les invito a que, a, a, que, a que tomen el... Aquí está lo, lo, que, lo, que, lo que estoy haciendo, unboxing entrevista por el Evangelio por Matthew Bates. Así que yo les voy a invitar a que ustedes eh, vean las notas del video para poder adquirir este libro, vayan a Kerigma para también, eh, para también eh, a, a publicaciones Kerigma para poder también adquirir el libro. Y esperen por la, próximo, la próxima entrevista con Matthew Bates, que se, va a, que se va a tratar acerca de la historia de la Trinidad, como en el Antiguo Testamento, bueno, como, como los primeros cristianos llegaron a, iba a decir el antiguo, el, el cristianismo primitivo, llegó a entender sobre la Trinidad, que es lo que a nosotros nos interesa también saber. 
pero en esta ocasión vamos a, 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 vamos a hablar de este libro, así que lo recomiendo, son eh, en español son 192 páginas, así que eh, en inglés son eh, 185, 86, o sea que es eh, un poco más en español, recordemos que el libro es un poco más grande y también tiene las letras eh, más grandes y, y también está, está, está bueno yo que yo que ocupo lentes eh, es, es, sí es más grande más grande y eso a mí me gusta mucho así que eh, recomiendo este libro vean el, el um, en la entrevista que ya está que está de, al terminar este unboxing y compren el libro así que denme un like comparta y comente abajo acerca del tema que vamos a hablar que Dios les bendiga y disfruten la entrevista Okay, we have here Matthew Bates then, uh, and he is joining joining me in this program that I'm doing, and I'm interviewing him regarding his latest book. Uh, what, what is the what is the gospel and Spanish is por qué por qué el evangelio? Why the gospel? I mean, why the gospel? Why do we need the gospel? Well, welcome, Matt. Um, can you can you tell us where you are and and what are you doing because you you have you have gone through a little changes lately. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you. So, yes, I teach uh, theology at Quincy University, which is a Catholic university, Franciscan uh, in Illinois. And I've been here for 14 years. Uh, my own background is more in the uh, evangelical, conservative, Protestant uh, landscape, but I did PhD work at Notre Dame. And uh, more recently then, um, I'm, I'm actually in the process of leaving the full-time faculty at Quincy University and um, joining the full-time faculty at Northern Seminary, uh, where I'll be following in the footsteps of Scott McKnight. Scott McKnight mm. resi resigned his post at Northern uh, as professor of New Testament. So I'll be joining the faculty there with N Nijay Gupta is the other New Testament professor that uh, is at Northern. So looking forward to that. Uh, that's a Chicago-based seminary, Northern Seminary. And, and um, Scott McKnight uh, gave the forward to your to yeah. book as well. Yeah, Scott's a friend. Yes. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an honor to get to follow in his footsteps at Northern. And Scott's had a huge impact on my life and on the life of many. So yeah, Scott's a good guy. I feel like 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 you like he's giving you the baton, like like you're carrying on. I hope so. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna try. I mean, those are uh, yeah. yeah big shoes to fill. Uh, but uh, fortunately, Nije will fill them more than me. Uh, Nijay, oh, okay. Uh, that's, uh, well, the the truth is, um, yeah, Nije will receive Scott's endowed chair. I'm receiving Scott's yeah. position in a sense as he's leaving. Uh, so we'll be working together mm. to keep the program going. But yeah, we have a master's program in New Testament studies. Um, and of course, in Northern has an MDiv and others. We also have a doctor of ministry program uh, that is mm -hmm. uh, purposed towards granting the doctor of ministry degree. Yes. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Because uh, I, when I hear all this, I gotta remember you mentioned in, in your program as well. Can you, can you tell us what your program is? Because uh, on script. Um, I always listen to it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I'm also a podcaster. And uh, yeah, I, about, oh gosh, it must be eight or nine years ago, uh, my friend Matt Lynch and I uh, started a podcast called On Script. And we really focus on interviews around new book titles and Bible and theology. And we've expanded it. We started with just Matt and I, uh, Matt Lynch and I, but we, my, I think we have seven co-hosts on one part of the podcast and the podcast has expanded. So there was multiple branches of the podcast, mm. kind of a little podcast family. Uh, but we, we interview mostly academic work, but sometimes more pastorally oriented things too a bit. But mostly um, that's our footprint is the biblical studies world. And so that's how long I've been following you, Matt, for oh, eight well, years. Well, wonderful, Lewis. Yeah. I've been following you for years and years. Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> I feel I feel we're at home to listen to your voice, actually, because uh, I listen to you almost every two weeks ah, <laughs> for one hour. Yeah. Okay, well, let's go into the into the insights of the book. <laughs> the question that we always ask is, what inspired you to write Why the Gospel? And what key message or insight do you hope readers will take away from it? Okay, yeah, so it's a two-part question. Um, you might have to remind yes. me of the second part, but uh, okay, so, okay. yeah, the first part, um, why did I write uh, Why the Gospel? And it's actually part of a longer series of projects that I've been unfolding around the content of the gospel 
And I really had done some preliminary work focusing on the question, what is the gospel? And, um, but I felt like after doing that work that I hadn't, I hadn't successfully communicated, like, why did God give the gospel in the first place? Which is a different question. It's a related question, but mm. it's a different question, right? And there's a lot of books that have been written around the idea of what is the gospel. Um, and so I wanted to do something that didn't just talk about what the gospel's content was, but to try to do a project that helped uh, readers to reframe and to mm -hmm. kind of step back and to look at the big picture, because I think maybe that's part of the problem is I, as Scott McKnight, N.T. Wright, myself and others have been writing around the content of the gospel. What is it? Right. There are. Um, Maybe the church has tried to reframe like, and to rethink, but there's a lot to rethink there. And I thought something that was more overt in speaking about the purpose of the gospel uh, might be a better reframing tool. So that's, that was the major purpose in writing the book was to, um, to, to look about, like, why did God give the gospel in the first place? But there was a secondary mm -hmm. reason uh, as part of that. Um, and the secondary question is maybe implied in the title of the book. The, the title of the book is Why the Gospel. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, it could be like, mm -hmm. why did God give it? That's one kind of question. But another question would be, why is the gospel still good news today? Like, why is the mm -hmm. gospel still compelling uh, in today's postmodern world where uh, the church is in decline in some areas, growing in others? But why is the gospel still a compelling message for the church? For the world. Yeah, and for the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's also the the other part of the question is uh, what you hope readers will take away from it. Uh, yeah. So of course, um, you know, I, I hope that readers are going to have a better understanding of the purposes of the gospel. And I think whenever we begin to explore scripture around this topic, we'll see that there isn't just one reason why God gave the gospel. There are many reasons. Um, so there's a, it's a multifaceted answer. But I think that the the heartbeat of the book is that is about God, is about God's restorative work, right? That mm. we want to like think about. There are many many reasons we could say why God gave the gospel, and, and maybe we'll get into some of those reasons as this interview unfolds. But yes. maybe the the big answer is restoration, and I want people mm -hmm. to get the idea that it's not just about the afterlife, it's not just about heaven or hell. Uh, but that the gospel is a much bigger kind of restorative message, not just for individuals, but for, for society and for creation. And that God has this big plan for the gospel, not a narrow plan about individual salvation. There is individual salvation. That's part of it. Right. But we need to get that bigger, bigger framing. <laughs> yeah, because because uh, the second question was. In your book, you emphasize the importance of the gospel. Of course, the, the, that's the title. And if you could elaborate on why you believe the gospel is so crucial, especially if in today's world, and and um, and, uh, and you have kind of answered that already, but in your last chapter, uh, uh, you mentioned the nun, the good for good uh, uh, chapter six actually, good news for the nuns, why they reject Christianity, and 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 I like what you say regarding uh, I'm holier than thou. Mm -hmm. then you should listen to us or we we're the real um if you're talking from an american they actually some some australian people are also saying we're the real australians we 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 christians we we hold christian values therefore australia australia is a christian nation Those, they, they have said that in parliament as, as well as they said in congress in the u in the usa and that puts people off because then it sounds like the gospel is more something that you do uh, here and in in you get comfort uh, uh, in comfort with with worldly powers but the gospel is beyond that mm. yeah so the the sixth chapter as you mentioned is mm -hmm. uh, purposed especially to addressing the the crisis in western uh western nations overall about the decline in christianity right as we're in an era where people are talking mm -hmm. a lot about people who either haven't ever uh you know, heard the gospel, and so they're a nun, like that they, they or they've heard mm -hmm. it, but they rejected it, they're not interested, or they're done, right? They they decided mm -hmm. they're walking away from the church, they were once part of it, but they're, they're either none or, uh, because they never affiliated, or they're done. Um, and so why is the gospel still good news for them? And the answer, I think, is that the gospel is the power of God for salvation, as Paul puts it in mm -hmm. Romans chapter 1, right? That the gospel is God's plan. There is no other plan, right? 
So mm. I mean, it's, a, it's a fundamentally good plan. And I think that um, once we see that the gospel is about a king, right, that that's the good mm, news yes. is actually about um, the, the, the heartbeat of the good news is that God has sent a saving Messiah or a, a rescuing Christ, right? And that Christ means king. Once we understand that it's about a king, it helps us to realize that it addresses our deepest problems, which are not just that we have like sin that stands against our account. That is a problem, but it's that we have poor leadership and that we are poor leaders of our own lives. And that that's mm-hmm. part of the reason why the world keeps going haywire is because uh, I'm self-interested in the decisions I make apart from God's help. Uh, the society is self-interested. We're going to continue to harm one another and harm creation, harm ourselves, right? Without having the ideal human who can show us a better way. And so once we get to see that the gospel is about a king and that he's providing wise, a wise pattern of life, one that is emptying of the self, uh, one that is a servant for other people, then God's restorative work begins to move forward in our own lives and the lives of others. And I think this is, um, if I could uh, just address one further dimension of that question, Mm -hmm. I think this is especially good news uh, for people who are observing the church because maybe the number one issue that people who are none and done have with Christians is is the the claim that Christians are just hypocritical, that it's all hypocrisy, that it's Mm. empty, or whatever it might be. And I think that once we realize that the gospel is not just about praying a prayer and asking Jesus to forgive my sins, but is about coming under his kingship, right? Then to be loyal to King Jesus undercuts hypocrisy. Now we need the Holy Spirit's help to stay loyal to King Jesus. Mm -hmm. We don't do it all, all on our own steam. But when we see that's actually the essence of the gospel is to respond to his kingship, not just to his salvation, then the church can begin to move forward. And I think the world, that becomes good news for them as they see that it's not all just hypocrisy. Uh, there is uh, a, a reality to Jesus's kingship and that we see salvation happening where Jesus is acknowledged as king. Yes, uh, it, it really brings out the, the issue that you also mentioned in your book, that those people who have rightly opposed that uh, being a Christian is not just receiving Jesus in our hearts or just confessing his as, uh, him as our Lord and Savior, it doesn't stop there. It, 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 it takes a whole, I mean, uh, in Latin America, there are some people who have rightfully criticized that, but they have not gone for, uh, far enough because they set up a confession of faith or a catechism as the thing they have to be faithful to, mm-hmm. something that the reformers left us. But uh, one of the issues that I have with that is that I'm not called to be to give my allegiance, my faithfulness to a confession of faith or to a denomination. I'm called to give my allegiance to a person, Jesus Christ, uh, who is my King, and and, and that's and, and that's uh, that's a challenge. That's a great challenge uh, because you can because some people like to uh, only deal with the text. But we're dealing with a human reason lore. <laughs> yeah. With a king. Yes. No, I, I think that we need to take to heart the work of the reformers, uh, you know, Luther, mm-hmm. Calvin, John Wesley, other uh, others who are heroes of the Protestant tradition. Like we we appreciate what they've done in launching Reformation. Right. But um, mm. they themselves didn't see that work as complete. Right. They, they, mm. they had a slogan, always reforming. Right. That we continue yes. to reform until we get to the, the maximal recovery of the apostolic church. And the apostolic church has to be part of the continuous stream of Christianity that we find ourselves in. Right. We can't be cut off from the apostles. So, yes, the book the my work is certainly um designed to help us to take the Bible seriously and the witness of the apostles. Mm. Yes. Uh, my next question or my next comment would be, uh, you, you proposed the idea of gospeling as a core Christian practice. Could you explain what gospeling entails and how individuals and communities can incorporate into their lives effectively this idea of gospeling? Yeah, so uh, the, the word gospel in um, the Greek of the New Testament is a noun, but it also has a verbal form, 
Um, we don't mm. in English, right? In English, we don't have the verb gospeling. Uh, we're kind of making that word up, right? But in if we're reading the New Testament in the original language, there is a verb to proclaim the good news, like to gospel, right? So mm. we need to recover that practice. So there's a couple images that the Bible, I think, would front for the idea of gospeling. On the one hand, it's the idea of heralding, like of somebody who is uh, proclaiming, a proclaimer, right, would be one image. So somebody who publicly is announcing uh, Jesus's kingship to other people, like, and we have a long tradition of doing that in the church of people who uh, stand up in front of other people and, and tell others about Jesus. That's heralding it, mm. right? But there's also another image that's very prominent in the Bible about, um, uh, about the gospel, and that would be to bear witness or to testify. So that some of the core practice then whenever we are um, evangelizing or we're gospeling, right, is to think about we're testifying to the reality of who Jesus is. And the mm-hmm. core reality to which we're called to bear witness is that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, and mm-hmm. this Christ is a, a title. It's not his name. Right? We don't just say mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. We, say, we need to say Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. Uh, because this emphasizes his kingship and emphasizes that the way in which God is bringing salvation is not apart from a king, it's through a king, right? We get mm. the benefits of salvation. We all want the benefits of salvation, right? We all want uh, to experience uh, adoption into God's family, and we want to experience being right with God, justification, and we want forgiveness of sins, and the list can go on and on. Uh, well, how do we get those benefits, we don't get them apart from his kingship, but through it, right? Because Jesus mm-hmm. becomes the Christ and is installed at the right hand of the Father as the Christ. And what's the first thing he does as the Christ? Pours out the Holy Spirit to apply the benefits of salvation to his people. So um, mm-hmm. we need to bear witness to that reality, that Jesus is the resurrected and reigning king, that he's poured out the Holy Spirit uh, so that we can enjoy the benefits of salvation. And we have to have that order correct. Uh, that's uh, maybe one of the things that I'm really urgent on in the book, is that we've often gotten the order wrong. The order we've traditionally <clears throat> used, especially in the last 100 years in the church, has been mm-hmm. uh, something along the lines of this. Like, Jesus died for your sins and became your Savior, so <laughs> you can be justified and by faith enter into a right relationship with him. We Mm -hmm. need to reverse the order. We need to say, Jesus has become the king. And by becoming the king, he offers benefits to anybody who will give loyalty to him, who will by faith declare their fidelity to him, right? And that that through that, once that happens, then he becomes your savior by pouring out the benefits of salvation into your life and into your communities. Uh, but if we get the order wrong, if we if we go Savior first, and then oh by the way He's Lord, then we miss the essence of the gospel. If we get the if we get the order correct, and we say Jesus is the Christ, and when He became the Christ, He offers the benefits of salvation to His people, then we're correctly we're correctly gospeling or correctly evangelizing. So a lot of the energy in the book is um, aimed toward encouraging people to get the order right: first King, then benefits of salvation. So, so, so we have said it the other way around. Is uh, yeah, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or, or in some cases, the free grace people, they said um, believe in Jesus, and you say you are saved. And and if your book, your previous book in Spanish, uh, um, Salvación por Alianza or Gaspa, uh, Salvation by Allegiance alone. Uh, it created a great stare because people said, okay, then we're saved by works. And and it, it brings up that um, that conundrum that, that the reformers, or at least Luther, wanted to separate works a lot from from, from faith. And, and you emphasize that um, that faith means that we do something in Jesus. And you quote the Bible when Jesus says that um, uh, at, at, at the end, he will judge people by their deeds, uh, even though they may have faith in him, but Lord, when do we? They knew the Lord, they knew Jesus, but uh, but but they still didn't live out their faith, and and this is a this is a shocking from, from for some persons have been shock in Latin America as 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 well I know it has been in the English speaking world so so um, so the so we have to you're you're suggesting that we are to 
that he actually enter Rios who says this, uh, that we should proclaim Jesus as king. And, and that's what, uh, and then that king becomes your Lord. Is, is that what you're suggesting? Yes. Yeah. And so you're right that um, we have to think carefully about what faith means, the Greek word pistis, mm -hmm. right? Or what, um, what mm -hmm. that word means. And in previous books, I have shown evidence myself, but also shown evidence mm -hmm. from other scholars uh, that the, the what's called the semantic domain or the, the range of meaning uh, mm -hmm. of the word pistis includes loyalty or allegiance. So that it's uh, part of like a big field of possible meanings, right? That one applied meaning that we find in the ancient world for pistis is loyalty or allegiance. Uh, and the evidence for that is overwhelming. Uh, so mm -hmm. the question becomes like, why did, um, why was that neglected in the church? Like the idea, mm -hmm. and I think you're right. Some of it has to do with Luther and Calvin's anxiety about works. Um, and I think we can mm -hmm. be more precise and we can say that uh, Paul was very anxious about works of law, which are not the same thing as works. And we need to be careful, mm -hmm. like works in general are not the same thing as works of Torah or works of law. And this draws on research work that's not my own as much as um, a whole a huge effort called the new perspective on Paul that's been going on for many, many years. Um, and I think that the results are very uh, well confirmed by many, many scholars uh, that Paul is not hostile to works in general, uh, but that mm. he's worried about works of law as a salvation system. Uh, and he wants instead uh, people to respond to King Jesus with faith. And that would include an externalized bodily dimension like that, uh, that you use your body to perform faith. Paul mentions this in Galatians 2.20, one of our, our mm -hmm. most famous verses of the Bible, right? Where he says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son in the of flesh, God yes. who loved me and gave himself for me. The life I live uh, in the flesh, I live by faith, right? So like there is, um, it's clearly something bodily for Paul. Um, and this would be something confirmed by uh, other scholars as well. Uh, I would point other people, especially researchers, to the work of Teresa Morgan uh, in her book, yeah. Roman Faith and Christian Faith, who, who shows the externalized and relational dimensions of, of pistis or faith. I will include those, those links in, on the, uh, down there on the notes. And let me tell you something, Matt. Uh, I have translated uh, J.D. Dan New Perspective on Paul. Yes, and I posted it. I posted it. I posted it this um, this year. I also trans I have translated Stendhal um, um, about Paul in the Conscious of the West, oh, and I have wow. translated as well uh, into right uh, uh, the the Paul of history and the Paul of faith, and, and many many others uh, into Spanish. Um, uh, uh, the, the also the the years ago in. Um, in Christianity today, the, the debate between Piper and, uh, and, and Wright, I translated that article as well, so people know. So uh, in Latin America, I'm known as, as a heretic because I proposed a new perspective on Paul, but yeah, well, yes, uh, that's well, what I think the gospel, that's where it should go. Yes, well, the research work bears out that the new perspective on Paul is not a new perspective at all. It is the old perspective, mm. right? It is the perspective mm. of the apostles. and. Uh, the yeah the the work confirming the 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 accuracy of the new perspective on Paul is uh, legion, but um but uh, Matthew Thomas uh, in a, a recent book has shown uh, conclusively mm -hmm. I think that uh, he researched the phrase works and works of law in the very earliest church fathers like looking mm -hmm. at how does um, the apostolic fathers how did Justin Martyr how did Irenaeus how did they receive Paul's language of works of law. And he shows that indeed it means like festivals and kosher and uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean any work in general, right? That, uh, that works consistently meant uh, works of Torah, right? Um, and so I think that the evidence is just mounting uh, that the new perspective on Paul is indeed the perspective of the apostles and the earliest church. It's very specific. Uh, although um, one question: you you, you are in, in in a Franciscan um, university. How would Catholics take on the new perspective on Paul? Because I know Brendan Burns here in Australia. Uh -huh. um, he was thinking about beyond the new pr perspective on Paul. So so how would how would uh, scholars? Because I know that uh, uh, Paul um, no. Uh, um, 
Pope Benedict XVI wasn't so keen on <laughs> on the new perspective on Pope. Uh, how how do you find how Catholics deal with it? Yeah, it's hard to generalize because it's such mm -hmm. uh, you know um, it's Catholicism is such a huge um, tent, right? That to the world sometimes it it, it presents uh, it would seem a united front, right? But when mm. you dive in, it's a divided house. Uh, there's mm. there's huge disagreements among Catholics uh, about all kinds of things, um, and so. Yeah, th there's sometimes a sentimentalism that like Catholicism represents um, something beautiful because it's united. Uh, the reality mm. is it's deeply, deeply, deeply fractured once you dive mm. in. Um, I would say that some of our our most excellent young Catholic scholars are certainly on board with the new perspective on Paul. Um, I would mention Matthew Thomas, who is actually Catholic, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. uh, in addition to him, uh, Brant Petrie, um, John Kincaid, Michael Barber. Uh, they, uh, those three, actually, that I just mentioned, um, Petrie, mm -hmm. Barber, Kincaid. Uh, they, have, they, they have written yeah. a book. <laughs> yeah, they have written a book. That's yeah, what I was just going to mention. Um, the book is called uh, Paul, a New Covenant Jew. I think that's the name, Paul, a New Covenant mm -hmm. Jew. Um, yeah. something like that is the title mm -hmm. uh, anyway, but yes, they would, they would certainly be congenial to the new perspective uh, mm -hmm. within, their, within their writings. Cause I have, uh, I have dealt with, uh, all elderly priests from Jesuits from Spain, uh, through a university, San Damaso. Uh, they're not keen. They're not keen. Ah, they're not, yeah. I, I mentioned it and they said, no, 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 don't pay attention to those things. And, uh, so like you said, th 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 there are various points of views within Catholicism regarding yeah, this, uh, I, this I think point. it's going to take time, but um, yeah, there's no reason. There would be nothing in terms of Catholic, um, like Catholic, Catholic doctrine as it's developed over time that would be mm. problematic for the new perspective. I, I, it's, there's nothing ob ob objectionable. About, like if you read um, the documents on justification that were produced by the Council of Trent, for instance, mm. There wouldn't be anything in there that would be, I think, objectionable with regard to the new perspective. Mm. At least I can't well, think of anything, you. yeah, off the top of my head yeah. that would be a problem. Well, th thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, because um, th this is an ongoing. Uh, months ago, uh, the new perspective came up your book because of your book as well, and everybody was talking about um, uh, Matt, uh, Thomas Matthews and and N.T. Wright and and um, Barclay as well uh, mm -hmm. regarding his book, the the gift. Um, but the question arose: Why having you converted into Catholicism? In my wow. case, if, if, if in my case and in your case, also they also ask about you and also ask about John Barclay and anti right. Why they why they don't become uh, Cat Roman Catholics if they believe in the new perspective? Uh, because as you know, a lot of people see the new, new perspective as a path to Rome uh, because of because some other persons have become Roman Catholics. But I said no. This is a this is a we're trying to get back to the basics. <laughs> We're trying yeah. to get back to the text. Yeah, I would say most um, most biblical scholars who have embraced the new perspective mm -hmm. are, are not Catholic. I um, mean, certainly it, it grew out of Protestantism and is still centered there. I mean, there are a few cases where there are people who have become Catholic, but those seem to be more isolated incidences that are probably for a variety of reasons, not simply because of the new perspective. But mm -hmm. I, I, I did my PhD work at the University of Notre Dame. And when I started there, I, I was coming from a Protestant institution from Regent College. I, that's where I did my mm -hmm. master's degree. And I wondered, like, would I be attracted to Catholicism? Would I, you know, change my mind during my PhD work? And I was mm -hmm. open to that. I, as well as I learned more, we'll see. Um, but uh, the answer was no. <laughs> the more I learned, mm -hmm. uh, the, the more time I spent reading the Church Fathers, the less persuasive Catholicism became to me uh, on on many, many fronts. But um, mm -hmm. my reasons for not become, becoming Catholic would be uh, uh, many, many reasons. But certainly their doctrine, for instance, of the Immaculate Conception or um, mm -hmm. uh, things like that, uh, they have no basis in, in church history uh, in any kind of real sense. The apostles certainly didn't believe that Mary was sinless, for instance, or mm -hmm. uh, she was, uh, remained perpetually virgin. Those kind of uh, doctrines are doctrines that are made up later in church history that have no rooting in the apostolic church. And, and we come to that conclusion using the same method as we come to the conclusion with a new perspective on Paul. Yes, that's true. That's, that, yeah. you know, that's what I explain to people. Yeah. If you if you use the same method, then you're going to have to agree with me on regarding these later the developments. So yeah. well, I just want to finish that. 
<laughs> I want to finish with that. Also. So um, the next one, um, one of the key themes in your book is the relationship between the gospel and discipleship. And this is very important. Mm -hmm. How do you see the two concepts intersecting and what implications does this intersection have for believers? Yeah, so, so it's not only... Yeah. Oh, discipleship is of utmost importance to our salvation. And yeah, whenever we don't think so, we have adopted a unbiblical and naive point of view. Jesus says that, you know, we have to take up the cross and follow him and that our eternal yeah. life depends on it, right? This is something that is non-negotiable. One of the things that has been challenging for people is to articulate why. Like, why is discipleship saving? Isn't it that if I'm saved by faith, um, well, if you think that faith is just mental, then maybe it is hard mm. to understand why discipleship is saving. Once you understand what faith is, that faith involves an oath of loyalty to a king, it begins to make sense why discipleship might be saving. Uh, but there's also, uh, as we think about uh, the kind of the infrastructure behind discipleship and why discipleship is saving and why it's the saving response to the gospel, there's been some confusion about how justification by faith actually works. And I think mm. um, that has led to the discipleship problem and to a misunderstanding about how salvation works. And uh, I think if we were to get precise about how Paul understands justification by faith, um, Paul understands Jesus to be justified by faith first. Um, mm. And so, uh, yes. yeah, what happens is that Jesus is... Uh, uh, in, uh, he, he takes on human flesh right through the incarnation as uh, a human, and then he's placed under pressure, like he's tested, and he has to prove to be loyal to God the Father, right? To and to us as he treads the path that mm. ends up as the the path of the cross, right? He walks the path of the cross, and as he does so, like God observes his behavior, and he sees that Jesus is in fact innocent. And so he judges mm -hmm. him innocent. That's called justifying him, right? And then mm -hmm. he raises him from the dead so that Jesus lives, right? And this, this is actually the, uh, the underlying pattern for justification by faith, that the, the righteous person lives by faith. Jesus is the righteous one who by faith lives, right, as it results mm -hmm. in his resurrection. Now, the same is true for us that it's as we declare Jesus to be our king and we enter into his pattern of life, we begin to follow the path of the cross, that as we do so, then the just person by faith lives, right? We, we then will be justified by God whenever we die and we'll have resurrection life too. So justification by faith, both for Jesus and for us, involves our ongoing posture of loyalty. Like it's as we enter into the cross-shaped life and pursue that as disciples that we are justified and that we come to final salvation. So uh, we have to be careful about how we speak about mm -hmm. justification by faith, and we don't want to cut it off from discipleship. Uh, so they do come together and they meet uh, uh, justification by faith is deeply connected to discipleship for our salvation. Uh, I noticed that we... Um this is this is a, a, a bit um, out of the questions that I that I prepare for you, but uh, we we talk about sal sal uh, salvation by faith, but we haven't, in, in, uh, at least in my in my um, I was going to say that in Spanish, in my way of talking, in my parlar <laughs> in Spanish, uh, in my parlé in, in in French, uh, I don't I, I try not to say anymore uh, salvation by faith alone because. Um, it's not actually in the text. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I, I know, I know the meaning what Luther tried to do, but uh, he has, we, we, that has shaped the mind that all I need to is to, is to believe, and whatever I, how I carry on with my life, even if I'm not disciple properly, it's okay, because I believe. Um, and, and I mean, can, can you? I don't know if you wanna. I, I just telling you something that came into my mind and also something that came into my mind is the Great Commission. Um, uh, in the NIP it says, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Well, uh, verse 18. <clears throat> he starts, all authority in heaven and on earth has given, has been given to me. So he starts authority uh, like, uh, like a king, like an emperor. Uh -huh. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. He doesn't tell them, go and preach and convert them and, and tell them to confess and to and to and to and to bring me into the hearts. 
he's he right away jumps into discipleship. Uh-huh. Um, uh, uh, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey, and teaching them to obey. Yes. To obey everything I have commanded you. So obedience means, like you point out in your book time and time again, obedience means allegiance. I, I, I also, and, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So, so I see here more what you're talking about, obedience, um, making disciples, not only changing minds, but changing your whole way of life and your whole outlook on life. Yeah, absolutely. Very well put. Yes, the life of discipleship is the life of faith and the life of obedience. And we don't do this alone. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit who assists us in living this life of loyalty to King Jesus. But we, we want to be careful as we think about like um, all the different purposes of the gospel. There's there's a great many mm-hmm. of them, right? Uh, the Bible speaks mm-hmm. about um, you know the love of God being the ultimate motivation, especially in Romans 5, right, uh, for the mm-hmm. gospel. And uh, we, we could speak about um, how Paul talks about the gospel being the, the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, and that the gospel's purpose towards glory restoration, not just bringing God glory, right? It does do that, but it also is for human glory, right? It restores our human glory appropriately. But the clearest statements in the Bible about the purpose of the gospel are in Romans 1.5 and Romans 16.26, where Paul mm. calls, uh, the God, says the purpose of the gospel is the obedience of of pistis, the obedience of faith, right? And that unites those two terms we were just talking about that are key to discipleship, mm-hmm. right? That, that's, that's a, again, like, well, why did God even give the gospel? Well, so that all nations could be loyal uh, and obedient to King Jesus. Like, they can practice mm-hmm. this loyal obedience or this allegiant obedience to King Jesus, and that all nations will be gathered under his banner. Mm-hmm. Uh, so discipleship is integral to the purpose of the gospel, Right, that, that's what that's what it's aimed to do in the end is to create this loyal obedience in all nations. And uh, and I always talk about that Jesus is sitting on the throne, but sometimes it's like he's sitting on the throne for my benefit. Mm. No, he's sitting on the throne because it's raining, raining through us, through what we do. And I, and I like what you say in your book. You saw the gospel in action when uh, I like it when you, when you said that uh, somebody from the hospital. Uh, pick up somebody's dog. I mean, a, a, maybe a worker from the hospital pick up a somebody who was in the hospital who lost their dog because they couldn't they couldn't take care of the dog and and went to the shelter and took out the dog and kept the dog until the patient came out of the hospital. And and doing that uh, for someone who maybe doesn't have any family, I had a dog. <laughs> I had a dog, Kylie, Kylie, and and to me, my daughters. I have three, twenty nine. 26 and, and 15. And when they would ask me, who do you love the most? I said, I would say Kylie. <laughs> Kylie Kylie is the one that I love the most because she will always run to the door. You know how dogs are, that they like you. They, they always want to be with me. And the last time we were together because she died like three or four days later, uh, we, we finished watching The Mandalorian together. <laughs> she was the one watching Mandalorian with me. And and yes, very attached to my dog. Um, it was a Chihuahua. And, um, but some people, the, 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 the thing that you mentioned in your book it really struck me because somebody can come to the Lord by something that we show love uh, to what they love. Yeah. Uh, and that really, that, that, that's really, I mean, it can be very trivial, but uh, for someone who lives alone uh, can, can mean uh, the, the greatest, uh, the greatest uh, show of mercy, of compassion. Yeah. Yeah, it says we we ourselves are restored, right, by Jesus's goodness, and with a mm-hmm. restoration process begins in our life. Well, then that flows over, right? That glory that like it, God intends for us as part of creation to bear the image in a glorious way. Um, as that glory is restored in our own lives, so that we're actually radiating God's glory as 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 we're intended to do. Like that can't help mm-hmm. but like fill other cups, right? Other people are filled up with glory. Uh, I love how C.S. Lewis speaks about that in a variety Mm. of places, but uh, in the book, uh, the Why the Gospel book, I point out, um, especially C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, and he has this image of a woman named Sarah Smith, who's very ordinary in her earthly life, but becomes Mm. a great, uh, she becomes glorified in heaven uh, in such a way because of her virtuous life, like she's a, a queen of heaven in a sense. Right. Mm-hmm. And that um, everybody, uh, as they see her, uh, their 
are almost tempted to worship her because she's so glorious, right? Um, mm. As Lewis's idea. And, uh, and what was her glory on earth? Well, it was that she had become so virtuous that she inspired other people to become glorious themselves, right? Uh, they, mm. uh, they, like, I like Lewis puts it that, like, when, when a man would meet her, right, instead of uh, being tempted toward lust with her, like, he, uh, they were uh, inspired to be more faithful to their own wives, Right, because of her mm. virtue and her goodness, right, um, and that that she had a way of recharging other people's glory, and um, mm -hmm. I, I think that the example that you mentioned of the dog, right, when um, what somebody had done that for somebody else, mm -hmm. had, had rescued a dog from the shelter uh, for the sake of somebody else. That's the kind of glory restoration that we're talking about uh, with King Jesus. Yes, and you talk about that in chapter three uh, of your book, and I, because uh, we're running out of time, but I just want to mention what really struck me is that in certain before I want to uh, before going to the last segment of this interview, in chapter three you talk about the glory of humans, and in certain in certain reform circles they all talk about the glory of God that God does everything for His glory, but God also wants to give us glory, uh, to include us in that glory. And to me, it was very, it struck me when you mentioned Genesis 1, 26 to 28, that we, that he gave us glory because he put everything under our feet. And also you, 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 you mentioned Psalms, which is quoted in Hebrews, that we humans, God didn't give the authority that, to the angels, even though they are more powerful, or, but they gave, he gave authority to us mm. for creation. Mm -hmm. which is uh which is is our glory <laughs> given yeah. by god yeah it's probably the major theme that runs throughout the book would be the the theme of glory right uh, in why the gospel there's many reasons why god gives the gospel mm -hmm. but yeah um as i already mentioned second corinthians 4 4 you know speaks about the gospel of the glory of the christ the image of god and then mm. this gospel uh, of the glory of the Christ is about glory restoration. It's it's not just about mm. God getting all the glory. It's about like humans being themselves recovered in honor or fame. That's what glory means. It means fame or reputation. And then it's as uh, like God is most glorified through like the recovery of human glory. Because that's what God intends, right? God intends mm. creation to be ruled by humans. And so, like, in order for creation to receive its proper rule and for God to get the most honor for creation, uh, it, that involves his restoration of humans uh, to a maximum, right? The, to the degree God can restore humans without violating their free will, like, that brings honor to God mm. wherever humans are, uh, are glorified. Uh, so, yes, mm -hmm. um, I trace through the book the biblical evidence for um, glory restoration of not just God, but of humans, right? And how this is connected to salvation. And even Romans 8, uh, the whole creation is yeah. waiting for the revelation of us as the children yeah. of God. So the last thing I want to say, um, uh, because you have to go, uh, uh, the last question, throughout why the gospel, you discuss various misconceptions or incomplete understandings of the gospel. And what are what are some common misunderstandings about the gospel that you address in, in, the, in, in you address them in actually in in um, chapter four uh, theories of atonement uh, how some people may go one way or the other and one of the things that you also uh, 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 address in chapter two is uh, the story gospels uh -huh. and one of them and I like to I like to mention it in this interview because it, it is the impact from your last book. Free grace, um, it has distorted uh, the view of, or, and, and you give the, um, and you give the, because um, free grace people they they quote uh, the the thief on the cross. The see, all you need is to believe. But then you mentioned something. I don't want you to mention it. I don't want to say it. You, yeah. you mentioned. Yeah. So uh, the thief on the cross is often um, it's assumed that like yeah that he saved simply by believing in Jesus, but that's actually not what the text says, right? Um, as um, uh, as Jesus says, he's interacting with the thief, right? Um, he ultimately says to the thief, "Today you'll be in, with me in paradise," uh, which is important, right? Um, but yeah, but as part of the conversation. Uh, that um, uh, he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, right? And this mm. uh, this acknowledgement then of the thief is not just like a believing of, in Jesus' atonement or something along those lines. He's not just believing that Jesus is dying for his sins on the cross, 
um, he's actually confessing Jesus to be the king, right? When he says, Lord, remember mm. me when you come into your kingdom, there's something personal, like it's a personal confession that I acknowledge you are in the process of becoming king and that one day you will rule in such a way that I will appear before you or can appear before you and that you will be able to reward me or not reward me. So um, we often read things into that text that aren't necessarily there and then ignore Jesus' words. Mm. Right? Or excuse mm. me, ignore the thief's words. Uh, as, as the thief says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's a confession of loyalty to King Jesus that he believes that Jesus will be enthroned as the king and that, he will, that Jesus will be in a position to reward him. So I would see that as a confession of loyalty that he's willing to appear before Jesus in the future. And that's intermingle with faith because how can you believe that someone who's been crucified is going to come in a, with, with, with a kingdom? It's, it's yeah. faith, but, but it's also, it's, you cannot separate faith and allegiance. I mean, it's, uh, it's, yeah. um, it's, it's something that we have done as, uh, as, as Christians and now we, well, you and, and I also in my limited way trying to Put together uh, and to make people understand that it goes both it goes both ways. I mean, faith is not just yeah. mental assent, because yeah. demons have mental assent as well. Yes, yes. I think we have to be nuanced, right, when we speak about faith and say that yes, on the one hand, it does involve mental assent. Like we do believe certain things about Jesus that you know he is who he said he was. Like he is the King, he is the Savior, right? Uh, but it has to go beyond that. And one level beyond that would be to speak about trust. And Protestants mm -hmm. uh, and Catholics, uh, all Christians have been very comfortable with this language of trust. But the trust has mm -hmm. mo mostly gotten aimed at trusting that the atonement works, like that, mm -hmm. uh, that, this, that I believe Jesus died for my sins. So it, our trust has tended to move into more the mental sphere, right? And what we've done is we've tended to carve off a final piece that we need to add. So we do believe, we do trust, but we have to add that we also give loyalty to this King Jesus, And that's the mm. part where I think we have been negligent as a church, that we haven't done serious business with our ancient documents, the Bible and other sources that would show that the word pistis, the word faith, does include loyalty or allegiance to King Jesus. So we have to have all those things. We have to have belief. We have to have trust. And we have to have loyalty. That's, that's what the Bible intends when, it, when we have the full breadth of understanding of what we mean by the word faith. Mm. Well, uh, thank you, um, Matt. You have to go. You got five minutes. But uh, let me ask you: your book won Christianity Today Book of the Year um, for for um, uh, what's the category they said? Because because uh, um, popular, popular theology. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and and um, and what you got. And they can I ask you what you got with that? Like, uh, you got a gift? You got no, or they no, use no, nothing? Just the uh, just the honor of winning, uh, which is uh, a gift mm. in and of itself. As uh, there are many, many books written every year, thousands of books. It's always an honor to have your books singled out. So yes, won the Christianity Today Award and also the Outreach uh, Magazine Award. Uh, so mm -hmm. both of, both of them were in the area yes. of Bible or popular theology. So uh, really thrilled to see the book. Um, honored in that way, mainly because I know it multiplies the reach of the book, that the book is more likely mm -hmm. to be read by more people. And to me, at the, at the end of the day, it's always nice to get a pat on the back for a job well done, of course. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, why do I care? Well, because more people are likely mm -hmm. to read the book and to discover its message when it wins mm -hmm. an award. And that's what it's about. It's about King Jesus and about people hearing Amen. the truth about King Jesus. So uh, I would assume that maybe that day that you won, you walk out of your driveway and you see a new, brand new car uh, <laughs> in a ribbon, no. in a ribbon. <laughs> My family and I went to dinner to celebrate, but uh, we mm -hmm. had to pay. <laughs> Yeah, all right. Uh, so, and uh, and hopefully next, uh, our next interview will be your book on the Trinity, which is which I'll leave it on a. Um, uh, I'll leave everybody to to look for it. Uh, it's being also published in Spanish this week, um, so we'll let people have a look, and it'll be on the on the notes uh, as well, um, so people can have a look. So hopefully we'll have you soon. So and what's next for, for Matthew uh, What What's next for you? What's your next book, your next project? Yeah. Uh, I have a, another book that's coming out that's a follow-up to um, the book Gospel Allegiance. So there is a mm. book called Gospel Allegiance. Um, I don't believe that one's been translated into Spanish. 
uh, mm-hmm. but there, that's published by Brazos Press, and there's a book to complement mm-hmm. it, and that complements Salvation by Allegiance alone, um, a book coming out called Beyond the Salvation Wars, Beyond the Salvation okay. Wars. Yeah, so you can oh. look for that uh, spring next year. Okay, well, uh, uh, do, do you leave us with uh, how to say uh, when when you're like in the like a, like in the, the Empire Strikes Back, you're left in suspense. Yeah, uh, I don't I don't remember. Yeah, we're left in suspense. Actually, I'm going to May the Fourth. I'm going to watch uh, New Hope and Empire Strikes Back and and, and Return of the Jedi on Saturday with my son. Wow. <laughs> so, well, uh, all right. May the Fourth be with you then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all Thank right. you. Thank you, Matthew. Oh, you have a good day, and, and I hope to see you next time so we can talk about uh, your book on the Trinity. Thank you so much, Lewis. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yes. All right. God bless you.